All right, folks. Well, I'm gonna we're gonna get things started now. We'll say uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Rob Macedo. My amateur radio call sign is KD1CY. I'm the director of operations for the VOIP Hurricane Net. I'm also the Eastern Mass Aries Section Emergency Coordinator and the Skywarn Coordinator for our regional office in Norton, Massachusetts. So, um, uh, good to see everybody here today. We have a little bit of a change in our agenda. We learned from uh, our Hurricane Center Director, uh, Ken Graham, that he'll actually be coming at 1 p.m. He was gonna kick off uh, the workshop. So uh, he's gonna uh, uh, present to us at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Central Time, and it'll be 2 p.m. Eastern for our folks on the live stream. So we are videotaping and live streaming uh, this event. Um, through some efforts of local amateurs, uh, we think we're actually going to have a fairly stable live stream. We'll see how that goes, though um, things could change there, so we just ask for patience from our live stream folks. Um, for the agenda, so that with that change, what we're going to do is we're actually going to have um, Bob Robichaud come up first um, to speak on the Canadian Hurricane Center and meteorological topics on hurricanes, and that'll be followed by uh, Fred Kleber, K9VV, who from the, who's the section manager from the U.S. Virgin Islands. He'll give a talk about the response, recovery, and kind of the hardening of communications out on the uh, Virgin Islands. And then we will take our lunch break a bit earlier, targeting for around 11.45 a.m., 12, and then like to have everybody back at 1 o'clock when we'll have the director of the Hurricane Center speak. So um, that's just some adjustments uh, to the agenda, and the agenda is in the handouts, and there are a few handouts in a couple of the rows, so if folks don't have them, you're welcome to uh, come uh, grab those and pick those up. There will be do door prizes and raffles at the end of the workshop, so some incentive to stay to the end for uh, folks uh, uh, that are here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bob Robichaud, uh, VE1MBR. He's gonna walk us through meteorological topics on hurricanes. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Rob. Great to be uh, back here in uh, New Orleans talking about hurricanes. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, my job this morning is going to be to, um, to kind of set the stage for the next speakers that are coming up uh, behind me and talk a little bit about, the, uh, uh, about what these storms are all about, talking a little bit about the meteorology uh, behind it. So after a brief introduction about, uh, about the Canadian Hurricane Center and what we do and our role in hurricane forecasting, uh, I'll spend a couple of minutes just going through some uh, uh, meteorological uh, um, aspects of hurricanes and tropical storms. Uh, but then I'll spend most of the time doing a review of what we saw last year and then looking ahead at what we might expect for 2019. So. To, to some people's surprise, uh, we actually do have a hurricane center in Canada. Uh, we're located in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, and that's a picture of our uh, building there. Uh, but we didn't always have a hurricane center in uh, Canada. And really, we can go back to one storm. This is one storm that uh, uh, my colleagues from uh, New England uh, remember uh, quite uh, um, nicely, and that was Hurricane Gloria back in 1985. Gloria was uh, a major hurricane, and it was expected to impact uh, the uh, mid-Atlantic states up into New England and by extension up into eastern Canada. Uh, and we got a lot of questions about uh, this storm, uh, what the impacts were going to be in Canada, what, uh, how strong the hurricane was expected to be. Uh, we didn't, although we could talk about hurricanes, we didn't have that tropical type of expertise and that's really the catalyst behind the creation of the Canadian Hurricane Center. Um, was Hurricane Gloria back in uh, 1985. So we've been in operation since 1987. Uh, although we monitor all the storms in the Atlantic, we don't necessarily issue advisories on every storm in, in the Atlantic. What we do is uh, we have what we call a Canadian Hurricane Center response zone, which is that area within the um, uh, the thick red line and essentially what uh, what we do is when we expect a storm to actually Enter our response zone within a 72-hour period. That's when we'll actually start issuing uh, track forecasts and bulletins on that specific storm now <clears throat> we also track all the storms uh, in the uh, uh, in the Atlantic uh, and we compare 
the number of storms that enter our response zone to the number of storms that we see uh, over the entire Atlantic. And it turns out about 30% uh, of the storms that form in, in the Atlantic find their way at some point or another uh, within our response zone. And if we look at just the um, the uh, tracks of storms in the larger database of storms that have come within just 200 miles of the Canadian Hurricane Center, uh, let alone our response zone, this is kind of what we get. So uh, clearly hurricanes are something that we get in Canada and that's why we have a hurricane center. Now, we also have a role to play on the international stage. Um, the World Meteorological Organization uh, has divided up the ocean basins um, that get tropical cyclones into what we call regional association, uh, regional association and re regional association committees. And that's, that's, uh, we're part of that committee as well. Uh, for, for the Eastern Pacific and the Atlantic, that's regional association four. Uh, and the U.S. actually chairs that uh, particular committee. They meet uh, in the springtime every year to go over some procedures and protocols in hurricane forecasting. And if you ever wondered who decides on the names of these storms, it's people sitting around this table. So the meeting uh, for this year occurred uh, just about a month ago, and at that meeting, um, they decided to uh, retire the name Florence and Michael from last year. So when we started, we didn't even have a, a seat on this committee. Now we're, we're certainly a, um, a significant uh, contributor to that committee. Operationally, well, we, as I mentioned, we, we track, for, uh, track uh, hurricanes throughout the Atlantic, uh, and it used to be that we would only get busy if a storm was going to threaten Canada, but now we get busy for any storm out there that's going to have, um, that's expected to have any kind of significant impact. Uh, we work quite closely with the National Hurricane Center. We send a couple of our forecasters down there every year uh, for some training. Uh, we, as I said, we monitor the storms, but we, all the storms, but we specifically issue track forecasts and uh, advisories for storms that are going to enter the response zone. Uh, a lot of our work uh, is with emergency managers, so we, uh, we do a lot of work with our EM folks uh, and certainly heavy media interaction as well. From an amateur radio perspective at the Canadian Hurricane Center, uh, we, are, we do have a call sign, it's VE1. Um, uh, HTC, uh, VE1CHC was taken, so we had to go with HTC, stands for Hurricane Tracking Center. We have a low power VHF repeater uh, at the center, uh, so we can uh, link up uh, no HF, but uh, we do have the VHF and UHF capabilities. We also have Echolink, uh, IRLP, and um, our public safety uh, agency, uh, has given us a, a, um, a trunk mobile radio so we can actually talk to uh, emergency officials uh, uh, as well when we get one of these storms. Uh, and of course, we, uh, we have a um, relationship with the Hurricane Watch Net and the VOIP Hurricane Net. We've done a lot of work uh, um, with those uh, groups in, in the past. So looking at the storms themselves, uh, there's a couple of things that we look at for a storm to develop. And one is, one of the most important things is the warm water. We need uh, uh, fairly warm water, at least 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. That water has to be fairly deep in the ocean as well, not just the uh, um, kind of the, the surface. This warm water has to be fairly deep uh, in the ocean as well. So we typically look for an existing uh, disturbance um, and then convection to develop, basically thunderstorm activity uh, over that warm water in the ocean. Uh, we also look for a moist and unstable air mass, so cooler air in the higher altitudes and warm, humid air uh, closer to the surface. And we also look for an environment that doesn't have a lot of wind shear. If we, as we go up in the atmosphere, we're looking for conditions where the winds change very little with height, either from a direction or speed perspective. So once we do, once we get that, then we start to see these storms start to develop. Towards uh, uh, at um, towards the surface, we have air that kind of flows towards the center of the storm, and as it flows towards the center of the storm, it flows counterclockwise. Uh, 
And then it starts to form these different bands around the center, and then the, uh, a lot of that air rises up into the storm and then flows out. When the air actually flows out the top, it flows in uh, a clockwise manner. So it's very interesting how these storms um, uh, behave. Some of that air actually descends into the middle of the storm, uh, and whenever air descends, we tend to get drying, and that's why hurricanes have eyes, or the center of the storm tend to be, tends to be clearer uh, because that air is descending within the center of the storm. So I'll have a, a satellite image of a storm last year which really showed how the air flows uh, counterclockwise at the surface and then uh, clockwise in the upper levels of the atmosphere in, in a little bit here. So hurricane season starts June 1st, extends, extends until the end of November, but as you can see here, most of the activity is really in the month of September. It really starts to get going in August and then picks up with the uh, peak of hurricane season being around September uh, 10th, and then it kind of drops off after that, and then uh, October can still be a fairly uh, busy month, uh, but then it drops off quite considerably once we get into November. Uh, the classification of storms, uh, when we have a closed center of circulation and the winds are between 39 and 73 miles per hour, that's when the storm gets a name and it gets classified as a tropical storm. Once those uh, winds um, reach 74 miles an hour is when it gets classified as a hurricane. And then when the winds reach 111 miles per hour, that's when it gets classified as a major hurricane. So we have... Uh, the, the major hurricane is, is a category three, four, or five. So looking at what we had last year, uh, the predictions from uh, NOAA uh, towards the end of May, just before the start of the hurricane season last year, were for 10 to 16 named storms, five to nine of those reaching hurricane status, and one to four of those hurricanes making it to uh, major hurricane status. And you can see the uh, numbers of what actually occurred last year, 15 named storms, eight hurricanes and two major hurricanes, those numbers fit in quite nicely into that forecast that NOAA issued last, uh, uh, last May. And as I mentioned earlier, Florence and Michael have been retired. Those were the two major hurricanes that we saw uh, last season. So these are all the tracks of the storms. You can see a couple in there, Florence, which was a very long-lasting storm uh, across the Atlantic, another storm that made its way up into uh, Portugal and uh, resulted in significant impacts there as well. And we'll go through some of these storms uh, one by one here. So last year was again an early start to the hurricane season. We had a, our first storm prior to the official start of hurricane season, which uh, is not that unusual. We had the same uh, thing the last couple of years. So Tropical Storm uh, Alberto um, was the first storm of the year, and um, it formed on May 25th. The satellite image here is actually um, uh, a satellite image as the storm was. This here is Lake Michigan. This is Michigan. So this storm was in the Gulf of Mexico and then came up and, and actually maintained its circulation all the way up into almost, uh, um, uh, even almost up into Canada, actually. We could follow that circulation. So that typically does not happen where a, a storm will maintain its circulation like that. But Alberto did, and, and again, this was all before the official start of the season. There are actually 18 direct fatalities related to uh, Alberto. Uh, and then that, so that was at the end of May. So then we had to wait till July for our next storm, which was Burl. And Burl went through uh, uh, rapid intensification and became the first hurricane of the season in 2018. Uh, and that occurred in early July. After Burl, even t simultaneously even, uh, Chris uh, developed and became the second hurricane of the season, again, fairly early in July, and actually made it to category two status, and then made landfall in Canada as a, uh, a post-tropical storm. Uh, and then uh, in August, we had tropical storms Debbie and Ernesto, which formed from non-tropical uh, um, 
uh, storm. So it, became, it started off as a subtropical storm, which is a, a, a storm that doesn't have enough tropical characteristics to call it a tropical cyclone, but then acquires those characteristics over time and then becomes a named storm. Uh, so that was in August. And then uh, once we hit into uh, the end of August, uh, we had Florence. Florence was one of our major hurricanes last year. Uh, and became, um, it formed on the last day of August and then became the first major hurricane of the season in, on September 4th. And as you can see, it tracked, um, we can track the, uh, the disturbance to, well, from the, the coast of Africa all across the Atlantic Ocean. So we had a lot of time to see this one coming. And towards the middle of the ocean, it actually uh, ran into some wind shear and it actually weakened from a major hurricane to a tropical storm. But then once it started to leave that area of uh, shear, it uh, re-intensified rapidly again to, once again, a major hurricane. Uh, and then uh, eventually made landfall uh, in the Carolinas um, as a Category 1 hurricane. Um, however, um, uh, the... the the slow nature, because it slowed down right before it made landfall, and that slow nature of the storm resulted in catastrophic rainfall uh, in the Carolinas. So this is kind of a, uh, a satellite uh, representation of the storm. Uh, it starts off at night, um, so you can see the infrared imagery here, and then you can see as the, uh, as the sun comes up, this is the sun coming up, so now we're getting a visual representation of the storm. And, and look at this cloud up here, and you can see some very good convection, so very strong thunderstorms developing within uh, the eye wall here. And then towards the end here, you can see this wispy cloud. This is the higher level cloud that's flowing out of the storm at the top of it um, in a clockwise fashion. But these clouds down here are going in the opposite direction. Those are the lower clouds close to the ocean um, that are actually flowing towards the center of the storm. So this new satellite that, well, it's new. We've had it up there for the last couple of years now in the uh, meteorological community. And, but it's a very high resolution satellite that allows us to see this detail uh, of, uh, about these storms. It's a very interesting way of, because uh, uh, satellites are so important in identifying these storms because they're over the ocean and not only identifying them, but determining what their intensity is and, and what direction they're moving in. So this is a uh, you know, pretty good representation of, uh, of Florence as it was approaching the Carolinas. So there was extensive uh, flooding because of the significant rainfall. There was um, uh, power outages as well. We recorded a uh, storm surge of 9 to 13 feet and a fairly wide swath of uh, rainfall in the 20 to 30 inch range with uh, peak rainfall amounts close to 36 inches. And the, the peak wind that was recorded was 106 miles per hour and again produced uh, some, uh, some catastrophic flooding uh, with uh, 57 fatalities and an estimated $24 billion uh, uh, in damage. And this was an interesting picture that I saw once the water started to recede is all the, the fish on this particular highway because this highway was covered in, in water. Once the water receded, some of the fish stayed behind. So quite, uh, quite an, I had not seen that before in any other, uh, any other storm. So now we're into September. We're in the peak of the season. Uh, Tropical Storm Gordon formed uh, again in early uh, September made uh, landfall the next day, produced some uh, fairly heavy rainfall, 12, uh, just over 12 inches in Pensacola. There were four fatalities with Gordon. And um, even though it was just a tropical storm, uh, there were 200, uh, between 200 and 250 million dollars in damage. Uh, Helene became a hurricane, um, was the next storm on the list, became a hurricane on September 9th. And it almost reached Category 2, but stayed over the ocean. Not much of a, a damaging storm there. Isaac also became a hurricane uh, in uh, early September. Uh, but again, no, uh, no reports of major uh, issues with uh, Isaac. And then Joyce was another uh, tropical storm of non-tropical uh, origins uh, that actually uh, uh, 
developed as a, as a subtropical storm that acquired these tropical characteristics. Um, and then tropical storm Kirk formed off the coast of Africa, uh, did cause some power outages uh, in Barbados. And then we had Leslie. Leslie was an interesting storm. It uh, formed, um, uh, it became a hurricane on September 23rd, stayed in the middle of the ocean, kind of did a couple of loops, and then it, it stirred up the ocean where a lot of the waves from Leslie actually reached the east coast of the um, U.S. and even into eastern Canada. But then the storm started to move towards, um, uh, towards Europe and actually made landfall almost as a hurricane but as a, a post-tropical storm um, and caused significant damage um, due to wave action uh, in Portugal. Uh, there were actually 17 fatalities and, and there's some... So some very stunning uh, video on YouTube of the waves arriving in Portugal where you had some of these high-rise uh, uh, hotels or apartment buildings where the waves were coming up to about 10 stories and just, um, just obliterating some of the balconies on these, uh, on these buildings. Uh, so this is the kind of wave action we saw with uh, Leslie. Now we had Hurricane Michael. As uh, we, we said goodbye to September, moved into October, uh, thinking, well, we're past the, the, the peak of the hurricane season, which we were, but then we still had a major hurricane in Michael that formed on October 7th. Uh, and then once it entered the uh, Gulf of Mexico and experienced some of the warm water in the Gulf of Mexico, it intensified rapidly and that reached a peak intensity of 160 miles per hour just prior to landfall. And uh, it, uh, it made landfall as a Category 5, and this, uh, this was just upgraded uh, last week. Uh, it was actually in, the, in, uh, um, in the, some of the preliminary data. Uh, we had it making landfall as a Category 4, but looking at all the data, um, uh, for the post-storm analysis, which the National Hurricane Center issued, uh, or re they released their report on Michael last week, they actually upgraded it to a Category 5. So with that, it became uh, only uh, the fourth Category 5 hurricane to make landfall in the U.S. So again, brought, uh, the storm brought catastrophic uh, damage due to storm surge and wind uh, along the Florida Panhandle. Uh, in Big Bend areas, extreme winds uh, caused uh, damage to uh, structures. Uh, about 50,000 structures were affected, 3,000 of those were actually destroyed. The peak wind that was measured was 139 miles per hour before the wind instrument failed. So that was the peak wind that was recorded with the storm, even though we know that there were stronger winds uh, within the storm that weren't necessarily sampled by a, uh, an anemometer. Uh, so it became the, the, the fourth most powerful hurricane to, to hit this country with catastrophic loss. We had um, 16 direct fatalities in the U.S. and uh, quite a number more indirect fatalities. And the estimated damage was at uh, $25.1 billion. And then to finish off the season, we had uh, Tropical Storm Nadine that formed uh, again uh, in early October. Uh, only lasted about three days, uh, and then there were no reports of damage or fatalities. And then the last storm of the season actually made it to a Hurricane uh, two, or Category 2 status, uh, and that was Oscar. So that was last year. What might we expect this hurricane season? Well, there's a number of things that we look at on a seasonal scale to try and get a feel for how busy the season is going to be. Uh, one of the things that we look at is water temperature. So water temperature uh, in the Atlantic right now, this is a representation of uh, water temperature. So fairly warm water in the tropics, as there usually is uh, year round. As we head into the summer months, this water is going to continue to warm. Uh, but what we also kind of look at is how um, this, how this water temperature compares to the long term average. Uh, so this is what we, we're looking at in terms of water temperature anomaly right now. So off the coast of Africa, there's kind of a pool of cooler water than average. Um, along the, uh, just off the east coast of the U.S., the water is significantly warmer than average right now. And again, this water is going to continue to warm up as we head into the summer months. 
but this is the area we usually look at at the start of the hurricane season to determine you know where we are water temperature wise in the Atlantic so right now the water is a little bit cooler than average off the coast of Africa which is what we call our main uh, development region so if we look at the contribution from water temperature right now we that would suggest um, a season that is a little quieter than than uh, than average now let's look at wind shear wind shear is another factor that we look at that will help us determine the level of activity over a, a particular season and for that we look at uh, water temperature not in the Atlantic but in the Pacific when we have water temperature in this general area in this box in the uh, the um, equatorial Pacific when that water is above average, when it's warmer than average, we have what we call an El Nino. So we are actually in a weak El Nino right now. Uh, and you can actually see that the water in the Atlantic, uh, you can see a little bit better here that the uh, water in the main de development region is actually colder than average. So the fact that we have a weak El Nino and the water temperature in the main development region is uh, um, is colder than average are a couple of things that give us an indication that maybe there may not be as many storms as at least the last couple of years and the reason why when we have an El Nino we have fewer storms it because it's because when we have an El Nino we tend to get more wind shear in the Atlantic uh, so in during El Nino years the winds at higher elevations are a little bit stronger and those are from the west and the winds at the lower levels of the atmosphere are from the east and those winds tend to be a little bit stronger during El Nino years as well. So the red line here indicates a lot more wind shear so as the storm tries to develop it actually gets sheared apart before it can really get, um, before it, it can really get going. So when we have an El Nino we tend to have fewer storms and so what might we expect in terms of El Nino as we head into the peak of hurricane season which is August, September and October. So right now the forecast for uh, whether we're going to be in an El Nino is for about a 53 percent chance that we're going to be in an El Nino condition, at least a weak El Nino if not stronger um, during the peak of hurricane season. So if we look at the contribution from um, uh, wind shear from water temperature and what we call the multi-decadal cycle, which uh, is, is essentially a period of time on the average of anywhere from 20 to 40 years when we're in an active period of hurricane activity, which we are in now. There are some indications that we might be heading out of that period of uh, high level of hurricane activity. We still don't know ex for sure if we're actually heading out of that uh, right now or not we'll know in about 10 to 15 years where we're, whether we're actually headed out of that or not. <clears throat> so for now, we have to kind of assume that we're still in that, um, that period of active hurricane uh, activity. So uh, if you look at the contribution from water temperature in the Atlantic, from wind shear, in other words, El Nino, and the multi-decadal cycle, uh, everything is pointing a little bit towards a average to slightly below average uh, hurricane season or at least number of storms for this season. So there, there are now 26 agencies or groups that actually issue seasonal forecasts. Colorado State University was the first uh, back in the 80s, uh, NOAA does it now. Um, and some of these forecasts have been released, some are yet to, uh, to come out. NOAA comes out with their uh, outlook on uh, May 23rd. Uh, but a group uh, in Europe that uh, we look at a fair bit, they're calling for 15, uh, 12 uh, name storms, five hurricanes, and two major hurricanes. Colorado State, which came up with their forecast uh, April 4th, um, uh, they're calling for 13 name storms, and again, five to two, or five hurricanes and two major hurricanes. And the next one we'll be watching is uh, the NOAA. Uh, outlook that comes out uh, May 23rd. <coughs> and I will add that trying to make predictions about the seasonal uh, level of activity in the Atlantic is very difficult to try and attempt in the springtime. 
We get a lot more uh, information on how things might look as we head into the early part of summer, which is why that, uh, that forecast from NOAA is going to be interesting to see uh, what they come up with. So the names for this season, uh, for this season the first uh, storm of the year will be named Andrea, followed by Barry, Chantal, Dorian, and so on. Um, so these are the names for this season, and I will just end by saying this uh, and speaking to, uh, uh, as, as a meteorologist and an amateur radio operator, uh, your reports that you send in are extremely valuable uh, to us as forecasters to try and fill in some gaps that we have in our observation network. Uh, we, whether it's me or Ken Graham this afternoon, we have a lot of examples of how one report from an amateur radio operator made the difference between uh, issuing a warning, ending a warning, and providing valuable information to the people, uh, to the public, so that they can take um, measures to protect themselves. So on behalf of the Canadian Hurricane Center, I'd like to thank you very much for your reports uh, and keep them coming, because you never know uh, whether or not your report is going to be the one that makes the difference. So with that, Rob, I'll turn it back over to you.